Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for a very special screening of Messiah of Evil. Uh, this is presented by Fangoria's Colors of the Dark podcast and the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Um, and uh, I just wanted to let you all know we're going to screen the entire film uh, here in the webinar. It runs about 90 minutes. Um, and uh, uh, we'll have a conversation to follow with your hosts for the evening, Dr. Rebecca McKendry and Elric Kane, the co-hosts of Fangoria's Colors of the Dark podcast. Uh, if you guys wanna ask questions, uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. And when we get to the conversation after the film, we will uh, invite some people over and, uh, and you guys will get a chance to share your thoughts in the film. Um, uh, Rebecca has also very generously gotten Fangoria to offer a uh, special code for people attending um, to get some uh, discounts on their yearly subscriptions. So I'm going to place some of those, uh, some of that information in the chat box um, so that you guys can take a look at it at your leisure. And uh, I'll kick it back over to you guys. Welcome back. Yay! Hello! We are so excited to be screening um, Messiah of Evil tonight. A couple of weeks ago, as part of Colors of the Dark, Elric and I counted down our top 10 personal favorite films of the 1970s that weren't franchise films. We put that big kind of rule that no franchise, and there was some arguing over what a franchise film is. Like, is the Spiria technically a franchise film? So um, we, we had a lot of debates, but on um, both of the lists, Messiah of Evil, I think it was number two on mine. And where was it on? I think yeah, it was, yeah, it was second. No, it was second or third because, uh, yeah, Wicker Man was number Wicker one. Wicker Man was number one for both of us, but yeah. And then um, after that, we were like, okay, Messiah of Evil, we really want other people to see it. But this is a just criminally underrated, underseen, just under kind of exposed film. Yeah, like uh, that, that one of my favorite words in horror that just never gets used enough is that phantasmagoria word that, you know, we, we've all seen it pop up at some point or read an article that uses it. And if somebody writes that in an article, I always kind of, ooh, I, something gets my back up. And I think of this movie as the ultimate example of something very hard to pin down, a lot of abstraction, a lot of really creepy, slow dread, but you wouldn't call it slow burn. And there's a lot of words that aren't right for it. Um, I know a lot of people have kind of, um, it definitely has a good section in the book, Nightmare USA. And so this idea of nightmare cinema, what movies, Carnival of Souls being one, it unstructured to the point where it's got dream logic and nightmare logic versus something like Night of the Living Dead that isn't like that because it's always a point to Night of the Living Dead, like trying to survive this moment. Whereas movies like this, and we're not going to get too much into the aesthetic and like the movie and the story up front because we want, you know, there's a lot of people who are going to be experiencing it for the first time. But um, we did want to give you a little bit of, you know, just background of how it got made. And it's got some USC connections that uh, could be fun for some of you. And um, but it's it, it's just a movie. I can't remember when I started. I think it must have seen it about a decade ago. I definitely didn't see it young. I wasn't like, you know, a young horror fan. I think it's pretty hard to see. It, it had a pretty rough release, you know. <laughs> really it's, rough release, you know. which we'll talk about when we get into the history. It was actually released about four different times. Yeah. Um, they kept putting it, it, it during the initial release. It did nothing. Um, and so they kept putting it back out every couple of years under different titles, trying to get their money back. And so even though that it started under the title The Second Coming, it didn't do much. A couple of years later, they tried it under, I think, Return of the Living Dead. And yes. George Romero's company, the Laurel Company, actually sued them. And so then they had to stop that. And then I think in Dead 19- People for a long time. Yeah. Dead People, they tried it theatrically again in the 80s under the title Dead People. Which and, is a terrible title. So. Yeah, and this was definitely not an 80s movie. Like, this is no. completely fighting 80s aesthetic, 80s style, 80s sensibility. Um, so I can see why it didn't do very well then, but it really did take it a couple of years to find its audience. And, and, and I still don't think it has. I mean, I think it's it's found the film cinephile audience, like people like us and people who are really into horror and go searching for everything. But because it's also code red Blu-ray, that's also fairly obscured in terms of companies and it's kind of been public domain for a long time. So it's been, you know, obscured in that way. How does a film that's not like 60, 80 years old wind up in public domain at this point? Legal issues like, Legal like, issues. like, like Night of the Living Dead is still, you know, has been for a long time. Usually it's a question where no one knows who owns it, but they just assume that they don't. And so everyone is scared to kind of step on it. 
Um, and so that's what happened with Carnival of Souls. It, it's always just kind of like, I thought you won't, no, wait, I, I didn't know I, wait. And, and so everyone's scared to kind of make a move on it for fear of getting sued. And 90% of the time, if you ever have a question about why a film is not on Blu-ray, why is this gem that I love so much not on Blu-ray? 90% of the time, it's a rights issue where everybody owns it, but nobody owns it. And so everybody's scared. Um, or there's so, yeah. one 80s song running through it. Yeah, or there's an 80s song and then there's, there's and it's all tracking issues. Um, um, but yeah, for Messiah of Evil, it did not do well to begin with. So I doubt that it was, you know, it wasn't anybody's hot button issue to figure out how to get it renewed or anything like I that. I think the most famous thing about it back in the 70s was that it's on a billboard in a Woody Allen film. And now that's not going to get much love uh, nowadays, is it? So because uh, Woody Allen is out of the conversation, it seems. So so yeah, it's in Annie Hall there. It's playing on a marquee behind the character. It says Messiah mm -hmm. of Evil. And that's probably the biggest attention it would have ever received. Like people were not talking. But, but what's really interesting is, and I think this makes for a pretty good combo afterwards, which is like that sometimes great art springs from people who actually don't really give a shit about it and aren't actually trying to create something that you might love. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's rarer that way, but sometimes it actually can benefit a film by going through other hands and uh, being recut by people. And just all, a lot of the history that this movie has, I think has added to maybe the mystery around the narrative that maybe wouldn't have happened. So I can tell you guys just real quick, a couple uh, who these people were. So we, uh, the, it's a co-writer, co-director uh, team. Uh, married uh, team who went to I, I believe they both went to USC they but both they, went to USC yeah they knew George Lucas very well so this is the part that I thought was super interesting because uh, I was watching an interview with them they they started to write American graffiti for George Lucas they did the first draft and then one of their managers said hey uh, this company has a small amount of money for a horror film if you can turn it around in two weeks uh, but you'd have to do it right now and they're like we're not even really into horror but let's do it so they jumped they said bye George they did this entire movie and then they come, but when they finished, George waited for them and they actually then did their second draft and they are the writers of American Graffiti. Uh, also uh, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. And they apparently uh, Gloria Katz is actually the reason Leia seems human in Star Wars because apparently she was so badly written by George Lucas that apparently she came in and actually gave her all these characteristics that make her kind of a badass, which I thought was super cool. Um, so, so that's where they are when they're, so they kind of took this moment to be like, hey, maybe we should be directing uh, our own movie. You, for, you forgot one of their great creds. Oh, well, we, yeah, we'll get to Howard the Duck. They, like, they uh, directed Howard the Duck. And there's a reason they didn't make other films after that. So Howard the Duck was the capstone in that sense. It was. Um, but I was curious because because to me, this movie gets so much right in terms of this kind of uh, maybe ephemeral and more art, art house horror. And so something I've always, uh, and, and I probably get me in trouble with some horror fans, but sometimes I feel like people uh, are cannibalizing the genre. And, and if you're only influenced by horror films and you're making horror films, I don't know how much new qualities can kind of run through that and and in the 70s you get a lot of people i i still believe some of the absolute best horror films were made by people who made like one horror film and then they're out it's not it's not necessarily like william friedkin is not a horror director he made a horror film he made another one later but he was really uh just a director and these guys their influences were super interesting so um basically the director was talking about he loved 30s horror universal horror like he he really enjoyed that but then he didn't watch any 60s and 70s horror film he had no interest at all which is shocking because if you, this would be the perfect pairing with let's scare Jessica to death. Like yeah, they both for a lot of reasons, yeah. feel like, like he watched let's scare Jessica to death and then wrote a love letter to it. I wonder, this one might be before. They're, they're very they're, close. Yeah, they're it's very. 70, 73, so probably first. Yeah, yeah, probably about the same. But yeah, they feel very similar. Well, well again, I wouldn't be surprised if that director is, because he's not really a horror guy either. I wouldn't be surprised if he had the same influences. Which yeah. so, so this guy, the reason I think it works, I think the thing he is getting right. So if he's not a 60s, 70s horror fan, he was a huge Lovecraft fan as a kid. So actually a lot of what works best in this film is that I think it might be the best, actually, which is funny because it's of any Lovecraft, I think it gets a feeling closer because most films are very um very obvious in the way, the way they feel love like there's going to be the big monster reveal or something this is much more about a feeling in the town um that i think will come across but but here's the sorry not to bury the lead but the it's art house film so the big influence on this and the most interesting and the reason i'm bringing it up now is because i think some of you if you know who these people are it will make sense as you watch it and might kind of make it more interesting the biggest influence on this film is antonioni 
And they had a huge thing for art house films and Antonioni, the way he used landscape and characters isolated against their landscapes of Italy. They basically tried to do that with their characters, but in this like seaside, you know, Los Angeles town. And when you start to think about that, you go, oh, that's what this, and, and his films are eerie too. Antonioni makes- I was gonna know, say, films. if you're looking at art house film, especially of the 1960s, even of the 1930s, when we're getting into like Maya Darren stuff, they're horror, even yeah, they have they elements, are not. Yeah. yeah, they're all very kind well, of- eerie. Isolation and alienation are, are horror be ideas, right? They're feelings and, that, and that's what, and so the other one, and this, cause I always thought the voiceover was added by the people who recut this film, but actually they did the voiceover and that was a direct homage to Godard. <laughs> oh, Godard. So, so it's literally like all this intellectual, literary self-aware filmmaking, they were taking that. Now it doesn't feel that way in this film. That's what's mm -hmm. cool about it. They took these elements and they made something that feels like a real horror film and it feels like a dream. It feels like a, a crazy nightmare. So I, I just found that to be super uh, interesting. Uh, and then the one thing I, I was telling you guys right before we started was that they, uh, basically they ran out of money before they could shoot the ending. They took it to every studio around town to try to get people to put in finishing money and no one was interested. And the last scene they were meant to shoot would have explained the entire film and it was kind of the point of the film for them. So they were very disappointed that they didn't ever get this. And then a French company bought it, kind of cut them out of the process, completely recut it, rescored it completely. The music was all nothing to do with them, even though it's awesome. And, uh, you know, thus all the kind of battles the film maybe had along the years and why they haven't necessarily been the biggest fans of their own film. They're, they're not really cheerleaders of this film. Yeah, they don't. I've tweet, uh, I remember this is granted 10 years ago. I tweeted at them. Yeah, and they're just they did not. not um, yeah, that was not like a yay go. Uh, yeah, it was it was very. Yeah, and I think they're probably getting a kick now seeing, you know, but also they were writing big studio movies. So it makes sense mm -hmm. that this was kind of little, little the, you know, their little weird uh, creature that they're were, they were carrying around. But I, I think some of those are really interesting. And they, the, the last little weird thing to look out for, every extra in this movie is um, an out of work aerospace worker. Because I guess they were shot in some town where suddenly they had to like uh, put a pause to all the aerospace work. And so all these people are just hanging out in this town. I'm like, that's pretty funny. Um, so anyway, so, and so th those are a couple things to think about. So it was recut, but again, it doesn't, these are not things I end up harming. They're just interesting things about this movie. And I have to say that I think part of the chic of this movie, part of what makes it so kind of wonderful to celebrate it now is that it has been so underseen and disregarding, be disregarded because if anything, it makes us proselytize it more. Um, yeah. Where anytime somebody is like, what are some of the underseen movies of the 1970s? Like Messiah of Evil is at the top of my list. I saw this um, the very first year we were doing Killer POV, all right, which would mm. now be nine years ago. Eight or nine years ago. Um, yeah, yeah I, I was at Eddie Brandt's, which is no longer there, and uh, looking for, for peculiar films. And the gentleman working behind the counter asked if I'd ever seen Messiah of Evil. And I had not, and I watched it on VHS. And this is only like eight years ago. So, yeah. And, and, and did Eddie Brandt's close? That location wow. closed, but they're wow. going to stick around. They, oh, good. Okay. They, from what I read, they are still going to exist. Like a lot of places, they're just relocating. No. Okay. The VHS thing is a very interesting part of it because I think most people saw it that way. And I think it's why it's not better regarded because it looks all washed out. This is a movie yeah. that, you know, if you see the best looking version of it, it, it has moments that are Suspiria like, has moments where they're lighting in that same way. And it's pretty phenomenal in terms of art design and production design. Um, very new wavy and art, art nouveau type stuff yeah. they're pulling in and just, you know. A lot of the color phantasmagoria side did not come through until I saw the fancy code red yeah. Blu-ray. The first time I saw it, it was very kind of let's scare Jessica to death where it was this very washed out color palette. There was an appeal of that. Um, but yeah, it, it did not take on kind of the Suspiria color tones until I saw the fancy version of it. And the only other thing I'll, I'll say before, just so you look out for it, in the opening scene, you'll see a man that is uh, actually, I, I didn't know this until the last time I watched it. Somebody told me it's a young Walter Hill cameo. Um, and I had no idea. I've watched this multiple times and I love, he's one of my favorite directors. So he must have just been a buddy of that group of direct filmmakers in the early 70s. So that's before he would have actually directed anything. So uh, so look out for that. Um, but yeah, no, it's look, it's, it's just an experience. Just like, uh, you know, Argento's early work, it has that feeling. Uh, you kind of just kind of let go and go for the ride and then You're just gonna go through it we can try to understand it afterwards together <laughs> let's okay all right uh let's let's do it i'll see you guys in 90 minutes yay
Welcome back, everyone. Um, wow, that was, <laughs> this is actually the first time I'd ever seen that film. And uh, I have to say, it was legit. And I'm really sorry that we didn't get to see this in a theater because it was so beautifully made. I have always wanted to see this in a theater. I, I have never actually seen it. Elric, have they ever screened it at the New Bath? Elric, are you with us? He is off somewhere. Um, well, bathroom break. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking I you might be the, 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 to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might have been the first of the three of us to uh, pass out from the second I shot. I suddenly have the little red. Uh, I, yeah, this this played in an all nighter at the New Beverly in the middle of the night, which is the perfect time for it. And it was actually called Dead People. And that was the first time I learned the alternate title because I was like, oh, Dead People. And then I realized, oh, it's Messiah of Evil. And I was really thrilled because can see a film print but to be honest even the film print doesn't look as good as the blu-ray in this kind of quality does now no the yeah the colors this was this was so just hypnotic kaleidoscopic um just so many colors even when the doctors were just walking down the path and it was switching from like blue to green to red it was just stuff like that that i had never picked up before seeing this uh the blu-ray rendition it's, yeah, it's also fascinating what like disturbed you color wise. Like um, I, I find the blue paint on the dad's face really disturbing. Like I, it's a visceral quality that I can't more than most gore effects. And 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 funnily enough, I wasn't thinking about it before, but now what year is this? Is it only three? So uh, Pierre Le Faux must be before this by Godard because at the end of that they paint. Uh, Jean-Paul Belmondo paints his face bright blue paint mm -hmm. and then puts dynamite around his head. And so it's like, must be a direct lift. And yet they're they're doing something so different with it. The feeling in this is uh, a lot of uncanny valley stuff in this film and a lot of stuff that made from the mannequins to the- uh, even the, the paintings? Voice. Yeah, paintings for sure. Yeah, the paintings, the production design in this, which I saw a question about in the chat, um, is just so impressive. I mean, it's one thing if dad's a painter, but it looks like the entire town is watching her all the time and keeping mm. them in the suits. Like when you first see the paintings, you don't make the association. But then when the entire town is just continuously in these black and white suits, it they just mimic the paintings and it just feels like they are constantly, constantly watching them. Yeah, and we see it and we say, not, I mean, it's a couple of, uh, it's a film of sequences too, right? Like uh, the sequence obviously in the uh, supermarket is the first like true horror sequence, which I, I still oh, get a kick so out good. of that. Yeah, and the movie theater, you see the birds influence, you know, you see the way Hitchcock directed the birds, you know, by placing Tippy in front of the church and she looks up and sees one bird. And then, you know, we cut away for a while to her smoking, and then we see more birds. And I mean, it's an exact replica of that sequence. And yet a feeling is so different. You know, it's a it's a very unsettling um, film, even when you've seen it a bunch of times. It's 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 unusual. The theater no. scene, I always find, to, I, I use that one in my classes, actually, because really? in it, you're watching all this violence on screen right beforehand. I have no idea what Western they're showing. I saw that pop up in the chat. Um, I have no idea what movie. It's got explosions. There's women punching each other. It's got everything. Um, but you're watching all this violence and just people being shot and punched. And then when they counteract it with the actual girl being killed against the screen in real life, it's so much more violent. And so it's, it's a really interesting kind of voyeur um, is the quality of it and, and how it goes from like the violence on screen that is very kind of commercialized to the much more realistic portrayal of it that they give in the film. Yeah, you, you're highlighting the scream, her scream and the scream by um, uh, is Anita, what is uh, Anitra Ford in the supermarket? Uh, they're they're just blood curdling screams. They're actually you feel the pain of wanting to live around these dead people, which often you don't in a lot of horror films, especially mm -hmm. a lot of zombie films. I mean, and that brings up another thing: what are these things? You know, I think it reminds me of the work of how, how in David Lynch films you don't pin everything down, so you think about it for the rest of your life. You know, these are not yeah. zombies, they are not vampires, and they're not ghouls. They are some merging of all these things and elements of things we've seen or Lovecraftian ideas, but that you can't just pin it down and move past it and go, okay, that was a vampire film because it's not a vampire film, right? And I find that to be something that lingers. Well, so dare I ask what the uh, explanatory final scene was going to be? I don't, I don't think- I don't they, think they've ever said. Oh, um, no. Yeah, I actually started Googling that after Elric mentioned that at the top, I was Googling it for the first half of the movie and was never able to find 
anything. I, I, I can tell now. Okay, so there was a there was a press release at the time where um, Michael Greer, the main guy who is through it, he said something to somebody when he was being interviewed before he made this movie, saying, "I'm about to play uh, the son of the devil in a movie." Now, what that makes oh. me think now. Because he he actually plays him in those flashbacks, even though they never show his face, he is the dark one. And so my feeling is that there might have been a connector to say this guy, Michael, the, the character he's playing, has been drawn to this town. He doesn't understand why he's been drawn to this town, because he is meant to be the vessel for this dark entity that is going to take him. So when he disappears in the water at the end, my guess is that is so as he can be reborn and come, you know, come back. And and, and so that- that's that hard explain, to tell off the film. <laughs> that would also explain the spreading of the religion element, because if they're just vampires, that's not exactly a religion to go spread to the high hills. Right. But if it is much more of kind of a satanic dark lord fend, then it makes sense why they're like, we'll leave you alive. Go tell the world about how dope we are. And I love when the dad says, you know, that creepy part where he says, I can't, I've got no hope now I've tasted flesh. So, so that's where the ghoulish part comes through for me. Like it, I find this, that whole sequence, like it's much more famous for those other scenes we just talked about mm-hmm. but the father scene over the oh, years sorry. is the scene i think i hold inside like in terms of my kind of the nightmare quality of that um probably it's family too so mine's the, the needle scene and i don't uh, know why that gets to me because i mean they're literally like ripping people in half throughout most of the movie but the needle scene really does um of just kind of punching herself in the leg with it but the theater scene is the one that is definitely considered to be most classic and it definitely um does some really smart stuff where it is holding one it's basically two shots like it is a really good um example of how to shoot coverage in a horror set piece um, because it is really only using three shots. We're seeing the screen, we're seeing a wide, and then we're seeing a close-up. And we spend most of the time in the close-up only occasionally cutting to the wide so that every single time we cut back, it's like the birds where suddenly there's like five more of them up until we start getting the people on her periphery and then it changes it up a little bit. But it's just a really smart, cleverly paced thing where it, it just takes its time getting there. And the single stream of blood is just such a smart move because they don't look like zombies. They don't have fangs. It's just such a small thing. Um, that you don't even necessarily recognize the first time you see it in the darkness. Yeah. And another one to look at, look at the uh, opening. I mean, I think the mood was captured for sure. And it, it follows um, a lot of this kind of mood, but like, look at the movie theater scene again. And it follows after seeing this, it makes it creepier because you, when you see it the first time, you don't really understand the movie theater scene and it follows because you can't, because you don't really understand the story yet. But when you go back to it, he doesn't know who, it is, but he knows somebody in this theater is following him. And so he's got this paranoia and he's with this girl on a date and he wants to get out of there. I think those scenes speak together. These movies, I think, speak together a little bit in terms of a feeling. It follows obviously has a, a, an engine, a story engine that this movie avoids, um, which makes it, you know, obviously more mainstream in that sense. But Somebody else in the chat said that this would have made a good triple bill with It Follows. No, they didn't. And... I said that. Oh, wait, they're, was that you? They're, they're citing me. I said Dude. that for years to you. For years. It was like every year on Killer POV, I said the greatest triple feature of all time is this. If what? All- I didn't even read that. So, well, actually, but it Carnival of make- Souls as well. So. Carnival of Souls would definitely do. I'm going to also throw Let's Kill Jessica to Death or mm. um, Let's Scare Jessica to Death in there as well. A much gorier uh, version is Let's Kill Jessica to Death. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but you and I talked a lot about seaside horrors yeah. and what kind of makes those so captivating, you know, that you are in this incredibly atmospheric location um, that most people go to for vacation, but at the same time, it is isolating. Um, everybody seems a little off. Like, and we were talking about like dead and buried as being like having the same feel of this. And I was even thinking night tide while I was watching it. it Definitely moments of night tide. And also because we never in night tide, we don't, there's a lot unexplained about the people that she might be part of, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other, the other that it's a big time is uh, the fog, you know, it's, Mm. The town reminds me of the fog, the way everyone's in on it, except certain people at a certain point. You know, it's it's got a lot. Yeah, you're right. And if listening to it, watching it, the good thing about certain movies, watching uh, more than once like this movie is it has a lot of very simple aesthetic choices. And one of them is the sound of the waves. Constant. Are almost the whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. 
inner room it's just you if you really watch it again it's just they're constantly under there and there's something obviously um dreamy about that for one because people fall asleep to the sound of waves or um and things like that but there's something unnerving about the unknown you know the dark title i mean you know you're the aquatic horror expert as far as i'm concerned and this is like a branch of the aquatic art it's like it's because you're not actually about what's inside the sea it's but it's about the unknown vastness out there i'd say yeah and this actually um i i've been as you know i've been in the middle of doing a good deal of research into aquatic art for a project i'm on and this actually opens up a whole new branch of it the idea of the seaside aquatic art where you're looking at something where it's set on the beach we're not necessarily in the water the whole time but it does have this very kind of dreamy um just very kind of ethereal quality to it um but we like for as long as humans have been around we have this love-hate relationship with the water where we are absolutely enamored by it we use it. it is considered to be one of the most ethereal it represents rebirth it represents primordial life but at the same time we're scared shitless of everything that is coming out of it um so the idea of having the dark stranger come out of it makes perfect sense rebecca i hope you're you're diving deep into under the skin for uh your seaside approach to aquatic or oh my gosh baby gets potentially taken by the sea Uh, that baby deserved it (laughs) (laughs) that punk ass baby kept crying come on Leave leave that baby No, the sea uh, across the board, I mean, the way that it's used, I mean, and you can even look at like some of the Euro trash films that are like these seaside things like the Jess Franco stuff or even getting into some of the more Greek films from the same period. We were talking about Blood Tide just on the show this week, um, where whether the show is the movie is hit or miss that the ocean is always kind of this omnipresent thing that is just always there like you don't need a massive set piece when you have that ocean just constantly pounding to the point where it just it it becomes almost oppressive yeah um there's a couple of things that i th- you know in terms of casting i know some people were pointing out like you know elisha cook jr everyone recognizes from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of films the old uh, crazy town drunk in this film but uh you know here's a really fun one i i think two of the most beautiful women ever put on a screen personally mariana hill and um the woman in the supermarket's just like utterly stunning but mariana hill what's interesting about her in the lead is she is in another film about a supernatural uh person who comes to town uh that could have the same title as that and that is high plains drifter She's oh the, yeah so so it's a very you could see a lot of similarities between the feeling at times of those two films um and need to forge from like the big bird cage and other films like that so it is it is interesting you know these these kind of screen presences uh in these movies sometimes you see them pop up in a couple of movies and you start to see some sort of pattern but yeah and you didn't mention joy bang who i think right. only maybe did six films um but yeah she definitely had she would have been known at this time period yeah. at least yeah um and i just saw um paul um gaithier i'm sorry if i'm saying your name wrong mentioned in the chat um that there also is a wendigo mythos to this that there is like this wendigo side because they talk about the donner party and the eating of human flesh which the donner party has long been associated with kind of the wendigo mythos of the pacific northwest of eating human flesh and then you become this savage beast that has to continuously eat human flesh so they blend that in there as well. So we just I got- I would they don't even know it and they're, and they're drawing on, you know? Because we, we were just talking about that in- um, We uh, did our Western episode. Right, but what's the, um, the title's eluding me? Ravenous. Ravenous. Yeah, with Ravenous, you know, very similar use of that flashback, you know, with the Donner Party kind of stuff. Yep. Style. But I wouldn't be surprised if these guys didn't even know it. And they're just, there's threads of things that I think are coming out of the subconscious with, I mean, I can't understate that they don't like this movie. And, and that's, especially Gloria Katz. I think she just, you know, she just had no interest. And it may be sometimes artists look back at their work and like, you know, undervalue things um, that other people find value in. Uh, but there's a fascinating, if one of the best article series you'll ever find, I haven't read it in years, but Fangoria did maybe a three part, might've been Gingold who wrote them. And it was like three and three, three consecutive issues of the magazine. He did a deep dive on this film. Mm-hmm. And, and I wish I had it in front of me before we did this. Cause I remember them being ex- really, really great. Like some of the best articles written on a film. Um, so, you know, if you can find those, that was 
probably a few years ago now, maybe five. It was maybe four or five years ago. Yeah, um, but yeah, it was a super deep dive into it. And I know in that he also cited other like-minded films from around the same time period mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we were seeing this kind of the isolation horror. And also what I'll call, um, because we were talking about 1970s and we mentioned this as part of our non-franchise episode, the adult problems, um, that every single one of these is an adult problem. My, my grown up elderly dad went crazy and nobody but he can find him. That's an adult problem for the most part. And so that's really what we're seeing in these movies. And um, it really just adds to it. But this still has that kind of swinging 60s feel to it. Big time. Where we've got like the what Portuguese royalty guy come in with his fancy um suits and you know and his what, two in and two, yeah. yeah having two like having a kind of a group uh group sex and things like that of the 70s, but then also uh, the I think the big specter that kind of haunts this film and isn't said as overtly as Death Dream is Vietnam. I think these are also symbolic of people who aren't coming back and this kind of it, it even when they don't intentionally reference it, it is on anything in this time period, right? Like that's the thing. Anything that's being made in 1970 is still experiencing the wave of their mm -hmm. friends and people they know having been involved in Vietnam. And so I think those are the kind of things that sometimes are overt, like Death Dream and, and less in this one. But I do think it's there, um, just the way the people look and, you know, the kind of uh, everyone kind of slowly dying. Uh, yeah, it's it's really it's really not like many movies, you know, especially on the art level. You know, I have to say, rewatching it this time, it reminded me a lot of this movie that I actually need to look up the year on called it's called Cthulhu. Um, mm. But it wasn't exactly a Cthulhu movie from a couple of years ago. It had Tori Spelling in it. And don't let that disregard you from seeing it. Too it, late. Was a, it was no, it was a Lovecraftian art film. And um, it was Tori those, Spelling. I kid you not. Lovecraftian art oh film God. where midway through you see the cultists and you go holy fuck is that Tori Spelling I kid you not like she must have been friends with whoever made it but it had this same feel and it really it feels like a love letter to this movie in a way where it was um a gentleman who remembers being he was raised in this weird seaside town and he just remembers that they had this weird religion and as an adult he comes out of the closet and feels completely kind of disregarded by that town and does not go home until his father, I believe, dies or hmm. gets sick. And then he heads back home and discovers the town's just as weird as he remembers, but it's got this, I don't think you ever actually see Cthulhu in it, but it's just got this, like, it's coming vibe. Like they're hmm. all preparing for this coming. And now I need to rewatch that film because I remember thinking it was really smart at the time period. Um, so now everybody check out oh. Cthulhu. I can't Tori even Spelling. remember what yeah. Aaron so, Spelling's Cthulhu. Yeah. So, side note, Brett Berg is really trying to get me to do one of these for Death of a Cheerleader. Oh, really? <laughs> I like Death of a Cheerleader. <laughs> so if you're out there in the audience and you like that idea, just give, give it a thumbs up in the chat. Definitely. Another, another film that I think would be good, and if this was a series, like a, a, a all day New Bev screening, we, all the ones we just mentioned, but I think um, now The Lighthouse would play really well because right. I could imagine the dark stranger kind of in black and white walking up the steps of that. And it's Robert Pattinson now, like he's he's part of the psychosis of this, of this repetition. But I, I think that film, again, like when I saw The Lighthouse in theaters, we were all together and I was a little like, oh, it's artistically well done, but I didn't feel much, but it, but we I think about angry. the movie a lot, you know? There was no popcorn. I, yeah, that's what I, know, I remember I know. from that screen. But, but it lingers was, no, with you. out of popcorn. Um, but no, the movie's <laughs> like still a lot of interesting. Yeah, a yeah. lot of movies like this, they linger with you years later. And I think that's because they didn't tell you everything. They didn't give away every single angle um, of what the horror meant. And, I, and that's what I mean by, I think this one has a great deal of like successful Lovecraftian detail. You know, I'm also going to recommend um, one that I talked about on our Patreon show a couple of weeks ago, which you need to see is Tower of Evil, oh, um, right. which is by the same. Uh, wait, no, I'm confusing it with Blood Tide. Tower of Evil, though, is the one that is on the island. Group of researchers and scientists go there thinking that they are going to find some type of hidden treasure. And then they start getting picked off. But it has that same isolated quality, constantly hearing the waves. And I have to, there's another one um, I want to say from 1999 called Dead of Night. Um, and there's like 50 bajillion movies called Dead of Night. Yeah. This one, it's also called, I want to say The Lighthouse, and it may be called Headhunter as well. It's one of those with a bunch of titles. Um, but it's about a prison ship that is transporting a serial killer. 
and all of these other prisoners and they crash on a bunch of rocks and they wash up on a lighthouse lighthouse island and one of the prisoners all band together with the prison guards to fight this like absolutely deranged serial killer that starts picking them off Mm -hmm. and it's all at night and it's just absolutely beautiful and the only light through most of it is the lighthouse um, and it's really That's cool. That's brutal. Cool yeah, I can't, I think it's late nineties, maybe early two thousands, but it's got that same, again, isolation, constancy is this oppressive force, um, that is there to take you down. And, and there's just something really ethereal to that one as well. Maybe a last one I'll mention in that way then would be, um, it's one, I think a lesser appreciated Val Luden, but it's called Isle of the Dead. Oh yeah. And, and it has real quality. There's a couple moments that it, it's one of those films with his work, like with the, the ones that maybe aren't my top tier of his, it'll have a, a couple moments that really get under your skin and other parts are a little talk. It's a little more talky at the start, but mm-hmm. there's a couple things that happen. And again, the waves are constant because it's sitting on an Island uh, and Boris Karloff's in that one. So again, that, I could imagine that film, having been an influence on this because he talks about his love of 1930s horror and you know earlier cinema so oh you know what that just made me think of that could potentially be an influence seaside horror very more art house than i Mm. will say horror hour of the wolf yeah yeah like the there there's a murder scene in that especially you know a flashback where he remembers this kid and drowning a kid and things like there's there's quite a lot of i mean that's in terms of nightmare movies okay that's that's a good trend you know it's, it's a good I had forgotten it's Seaside, but it's also a good segue to like nightmare cinema. Like mm-hmm. to me, that would be maybe my number one is probably Hour of the Wolf because it's both literally about nightmares, but the nightmare sequences in it are, I think, the most disturbing I've ever seen. I mean, they are just, these characters are so intensely uh, creepy and off-putting and strange. And yeah, yeah, you're right. That probably was an influence on this too. And yeah. that's Igmar Bergman, somebody who, you know, we're used to seeing maybe nightmarish images, but never a straight horror film. And that's pretty close to a straight horror film, even though it's still his aesthetic and art house. Yeah. Yeah, great. I'm, gl- I'm really glad you remember that one because I hadn't, yeah, let's put that in our full day of- <laughs> Yeah, that definitely, that I needs that to be film. in the screening. Yeah. And somebody mentioned this earlier in the chat that this feels so much like a Lana Del Rey video because it is really kind of infusing that- uh, kind of post hippie culture of the 1970s, but it's very California. Well, she looked, I think time. the lead actress also looked a bit Looks, like her. Her yeah. hair reminded me of her. So I think that's a good call, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's no there's a lot of her. this that I'll say, like, is a lot of Del Let Ray infused. Um, so yeah, but we'll put some of that in. And apparently, I'm not the only one who has seen um, the Cthulhu movie. I'm trying to remember because Jules Minton also mentioned it. Aaron Spelling, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's story spelling. I don't I know, think but Aaron I like to believe Aaron produced it. I swear, it's just one of those things, much like Walter Hill in this, where you're just like, you know, they're scanning pe- people in the town, the weird cultists, and all of a sudden you're like, that's fucking Tori spelling. And then you Google it and it's like Tori spelling. Um, but it was only a couple of years ago that this came out. So. Oh, here's a, there's a good wreck from somebody else with the Seaside Horror saying The Last Wave by Peter Weir, which is oh, yeah. very cosmic in the, like the sound design, especially is it's really something, you know, it's mm-hmm. definitely an art house drama type film, but it has this one element of horror that runs through it. Um, yeah, good call. Uh, well, just, I, I just want to jump in here for one second. I'm going to try and like write the movie titles down into the chat because. Oh, that's I, great. So um, too too late. We won't remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do. I'll see what I can do. I will say. In the meantime, um, can we bring in Gabriel Neeb? Yeah, definitely. Um, Excellent. Gabriel is one of my horror students um, from a few summers ago, and um, at USC, and he is an awesome filmmaker. But while we were actually watching this, he somehow was able to dig out the 1974 review of the movie in the LA Times. Are you with oh, us, nice. Gabriel? Hello. Hey, Gabe. How you I doing? I my disembodied voices. <laughs> You're welcome to turn on your camera if you can. Uh, I'm gonna do this. Um, oh no, we're also getting a crazy echo. No, still here. His wife is helping him. No worries. <laughs> hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, interestingly, because we just got back from uh, San Simeon, which is a uh, near Point Doom. The other that's, point doom, yeah. Yeah, that's near okay, point yeah, doom. Back from a San Simeon. I mean, this is meant to be a fake fake one, one, but... yeah, yeah, Chris Castle, and it fits perfectly the idea of a, a small, a small haunted town. 
Yeah. I want to drive up the coast because I want to see the places like this. Like I want to see the fog location and Santa Mira and all of those just fantastic, you know, what becomes the lost boy Santa Carla and things like that. God, that'd be a good so. horror film. If you could take over San Simeon and just have, have that place being a inv- home invasion movie in that place. That's the crazy outside of Elvis's house. It's the strangest place I've ever been inside. Yeah. Just- it's basically, it's in Graceland uh, last summer. Like, You're right. That's weird. That's yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell us uh, the newspaper article. Um, tell us about it. It was so weird. Okay. Uh, well, um, I have a small hobby to like uh, dig up the original uh, print ads for um, movies, especially the older, the better sometimes. Um, 70s are like my re- uh, weird vintage time period. Um, so I dug up uh, through the LA Times website. Well, they're a historical website. The April 23rd edition, which uh, featured uh, the double feature of Messiah of Evil and uh, Flesh and Blood. Has anybody ever seen Flesh and Blood? Is that the Flesh and Blood show? I think Paul Verhoeven movie? No, I don't think so. Uh, that's Flesh and Bone. Oh, Flesh and Bone. There's no, one no. called the Flesh and Blood show that's British. Really not well seen. I don't know if that's the same one. I'll look it I'd up. I have to look it up. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, look at the ad again. But uh, yeah, um, and of course, I mean, you'll, I personally like to look at the listings. That would and be it. Flesh and Blood show is 1972. It's a Pete Walker film, the same guy who did Frightmare. No, the the as right. Paul Verhoeven did make Flesh and Blood, not Flesh and Bone. Oh, okay. It's Flesh Plus Blood from Paul Verhoeven in '85, but that might Bone, not be the what blood. you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's just uh, one of the little um, things I found, and uh, the ad, the uh, distribution was uh, interesting because it's the quintessential grindhouse uh, exploitation house kind of a uh, distribution because it's lots of drive-ins, lots of little theaters, and uh, they have like since closed. Oh, wow. So it did not play any of the big theaters. That no. makes sense. <laughs> Nothing I'd ever heard of. I'm not even sure if any of the uh, locations are still around. Wow. Was it playing under the Messiah of Evil titling or was it there under? Yes, it was. Okay. At least the 75 version was. Nice. Okay. That's so cool. Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to have you do that for some of the other titles since you uh, huh. have the intel. Thank you do so we, do much. Do we have the actual review oh. we could read or not? Uh, I'd have to dig it up. Um, okay, but, that's uh, fine. Yeah. It's weird. The review is from like two days later. Hmm. So like uh, it opened on Wednesday, the 23rd of April. And then two days later, uh, they the review shows up. Um, it ter- it was, uh, was a total pan, but LA Times, 1975. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so they did not enjoy the movie. <laughs> Sadly, no. Oh, well, thank you so much, Gabe. It's good seeing you. I hope we can see you in person soon. Hey, how are you doing? Oh my gosh. It's good Same people didn't like the thing. Let's not forget that. These critics who call themselves critics. They don't like a lot of good movies, so I don't put Aww. much stock in them personally. <laughs> Never have. Oh my gosh. Well, it is really good to see both of you, and we hope to see you at live screening super soon. Yes. Oh my gosh. Have a good one, guys. One shot down each. Yeah. Oh my, we just, all three of us got our second one today. Um, so yeah, my arm, I, I'm still can't. standing. I'm, I'm feeling a little, I'm feeling a little, little, eh, but, um, and my arm hurts, but still doing okay. The first shot was breezy. <laughs> uh, we're almost and there. I'm sending you a dinosaur thing and a roller skating thing called in about two weeks, just FYI. Oh my gosh. Now my daughter is going to like lose her shit. That's like her jam is dinosaurs and um, roller skating across the board. Thank you so much, Judy. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Have a good one guys. Pleasure. Um, Okay. Two things. Uh, Feel free to give me some names of people you want to bring over. And Elric, when you're texting, um, when you're using the chat, switch it over to panelists and attendees because otherwise only I'm seeing it. Oh, how do I do that? I just see open. Oh, oh you're saying the chat. Be... I was looking at Q&A. Sorry, what's the yeah. chat? Okay. Oh, they're all two panelists. Things. It says all panelists. Oh, and attendees. Got it. So you can just add the light. Yeah, it's just adding the lighthouse and Salsa Road. Okay, you got it though. Um, yeah, just who, whoever. I mean, we can add and you know do Q and A non about the movie too. Like anyone. Well, there, <laughs> there are definitely some very um, uh, off-topic questions. Uh, like Rebecca, what's your favorite wine? <laughs> I don't drink wine. 
that yeah, you much. Did about, you're meant to say girls. that like Gary Oldman. What are you doing? You're meant to say, <laughs> I never drink wine. I never Come drink on. wine. Um, no, I'm 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 more of like a liquor girl. But thank you. You're for a teetotaler. Asking. teetotaler. I, <laughs> what was the, the what was the uh, uh, the verdict on Final Girls wine? It was actually really good, and I am not a wine drinker. I had the rose there. It was pink. Um, again, I, I don't know my wines that well. I think I gave you guys the Marlowe's, right, Elric? I think I have some, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm a red wine person. I don't, white wine to me isn't wine. <laughs> See, the it's reds. Weird. It's strong water or something. I don't I'm know. one of those people, if I drink, it's the reason I don't drink wine is if I drink red wine, my face gets like beet red and super hot. And then the next day I have the worst headache of my life. Um, so I'm much more of a, I'm just going to get drunk really fast on whiskey and then that's it. So, yeah. Um, so conventions. Let me answer Scott Cleland just said, thanks for the recommendations. Can't quite put my finger on the pulse of what makes these movies have that same feeling of empty dread. I think that's exactly it. I don't think yeah. anything we can really say is going to necessarily add to that. I think you can point out a lot of moments, but there is something, um, there's a quality from your nightmares that this is feels more like than most movies get to. That's of all the movies brought up today. I, I would really recommend people if they're, you know, into it to try that hour of the wolf recommendation too, mm -hmm. because it's this like somebody trying to visualize nightmares. Horror movies have been doing that since the beginning of horror movies, but it's usually for story reasons. It's usually to give you a quick plot. Uh, infuse or a quick scare that's usually why we see nightmares in movies these these films feel like waking nightmares that you can't quite wake up from and i think um if you look at uh, twin peaks fire walk with me has a very similar feeling there's moments in that that are you feel kind of trapped being laura palmer in that film and it's a very frightening thing to be because she's not in control i guess and so I, I think that that is something but it is it's really it's my favorite thing in horror honestly it's my if it, if i could pinpoint it i wouldn't need to make movies or talk about movies anymore you know but i do find it endlessly fascinating and that type, that dreamlike quality, it's very hard to get made now. Um, our predilection right now with horror, at least big budget studio horror, is that you ground it as much in reality as possible so that when the creature who only appears in the dark comes out, um, that it feels all the more shocking. At least that's the theory. Um, but yeah, I'm always way more drawn to these movies. And we still see some of these. We just see them indie. more on indie scale. Yeah. Um, like I just even watched, what was the one that you recommended to me a couple days ago that I didn't like and text you right afterwards. And now three days later, I'm like, I really liked that. Well, movie. I haven't seen it yet. So you, you put me off watching you, it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I texted you at the end and I was like, you know what? You need to watch it. You somebody told to us to watch it from the, if somebody listens to the show said I would love it. So I told you to see it. Then you watched and told me, to, and then so I didn't want to watch. Anyway, it's no, a but vicious now you chain. need to see it. Yeah, I will, you, I will. you go. It? You're in my head, or you yeah, go yeah, to my I'm, head. I can't get, it, it was. A, it's a, from a couple years ago, but I think it only just hit Netflix. And I, I'll pull it up. It's. I think it's called "You Go to My Head." Maybe it's what country? Is it foreign it's, language? Right. Well, this is where it gets confusing. It is a Flemish, Belgium, French production filmed entirely in the Sahara deserts of Morocco. You go to my head. That's so it. You can find it on Netflix or Amazon. I think you go to my head. I'll try to watch it before so as we can. We won't You're talk gonna, about here. It's nightmare logic. It's, okay. it's, I won't say nightmare because that makes it sound too much like horror. It's not horror. Don't go in expecting horror. It's just doing this the whole time. It's okay. just this languid kind of mood piece. Um, and then occasionally things happen, which is why as I was watching it, I was texting you going, I can't handle this. I don't, it was like giving me an anxiety attack because it was just people walking around looking at scenery. It um, worried me that and, it's long. Like I think what is. put me off was like 112 minutes and I'm always like, like I like this length that we just watched for this kind of movie personally, like 80 minutes, 85. Um, I did want to answer quickly from what, the very start of the night somebody asked and I do think I the answer to this which was um they're asking about on amazon prime you can see the pan and scan version and it has the original song mm -hmm. hold on to love by ron mckinnon and they they said they love that piece of music i'm with you i love that song and the first time i saw this film that song was definitely part of it i can tell you unequivocally without even <laughs> looking it up so so it's based on nothing the reason that pr is not in this version we're watching i'm sure is a copyright i'm sure that the um the people who put out uh, code red are, are doing a beautiful transfer of a movie that no one really owns. And they are putting that version out because they know they can't be sued. If they put out the version with that song, chances are they don't own that song and they probably would be in trouble. So that's my guess why there's a couple different versions. I, I agree though, even though it's, I'm sure the filmmakers didn't want that song in it. Um, they wouldn't have, but I, I really, it's just atmospheric. And when you see a movie once you get something in your head, um, like a track like that. And so it makes it very seventies though, that's for sure. 
Yeah. Um, let's see here. Let's bring some people over. Um, you know what? Let's bring Jessica Evans because she's speaking my language. <laughs> All right. Jessica, feel free to jump in. Oh, shit. Hey, folks. What's uh, up, Jessica? Not too much. I am in pajamas and uh, <laughs> just chilling on my uh, couch. So. That's how we do this. Elric and I said that that was like, you know, until we can get back in theaters, there is something beautiful about doing these in like pajama pants. Totally, totally. Um, no, I've just, I've, I've listened to you folks for a long time. Uh, Rebecca, I've listened to Nightmare University and Thank all you. Of the other but I'm definitely a big fan of the aquatic horror. Um, so I was just hoping, uh, you know, since you guys are up here, uh, you know, do you have any uh, deep cuts or any intel on upcoming flicks? Because that is my jam. And well, that's something that well, I love. There's one that I'm really excited about. But I me think. too. Yes, I wonder um, if it'll be the same one. You go first and I'll see if it's the same movie. Okay, I don't think it's gonna be. Um, okay. Because the next season of American Horror Story is aquatic I, horror. I, um, I, Heard. Yeah, Wait, I thought it was double features, isn't it? Like two separate. Yeah, scenes? but it's one is set in the water and one is set on the beach. So oh. either way, we're still getting some aquatic goodness. And um, some of the folks who, if you've been listening for a while, um, a couple of the folks that we've had on past shows are directing um, different episodes of it. So it's got some good people behind the wheel um, this time. So I am so, it, it, I have to say like American Horror Story, some of the seasons I have absolutely loved and then sometimes, um, whatever that weird one was about the Roanoke Colony, I just yeah. lost. Just, I think it was just I called Roanoke. It. Roanoke. By, by far the weakest There's one. a lot of shark jumping in the last few years, I feel. Yeah. Actually, I liked the camp one. I do yeah, have to say, I, I really yeah. enjoyed the camp one. Um, but yeah, so it's been kind of hit or miss for me. I can't raise my arm. Ow. Um, for me, the, the best one was Asylum. Like that one just so was like oh. legitimately scary. Coven. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Coven for me, that was just like women, witches. Yeah, witch and ambition. I love that one. Just spoke my language. I still love the first because we didn't know what it was. Like when Dylan, Mc spoiler, when Dylan McDermott, like one of the characters dies, like towards the end, I remember just being utterly shocked because I thought I was watching a TV shit series. I uh -huh. thought there was going to be a second series. I thought it, this was who I was invested in. As soon as I knew it was all anthology, I there's something less invested for me because I'm not, you know, I need to be surprised. No way. Um, just quickly, I'll, I'll let you know this one. I'm I'm so. I cannot wait for this movie of all the movies coming out in the next couple of years. So uh, I love the film Inside. Um, and we talk about their French film Livid quite a lot. The oh, new yeah. film by the directors of these films is making, it just looks utterly crazy. It's called The Deep House. And it's two divers who dive into the deep aquatic and they find a perfect preserved house at the bottom of the ocean that you can go inside. Like it's not underwater once they go in the house. And it just looks so mysterious oh, cool i know like it's a total becca movie if ever there was one um and i and i know nothing about it you know i just know it's coming out pretty soon and it looks like they've only got like two actors even listed in the credits so who knows what well, that's gonna how be many like. people can you have in a house at the bottom of the ocean i mean yeah so but it's just like what a cool idea so again like kind of like atlantis or something um so yeah we'll see but, but that's cool it's good yeah I, we're always on the hunt for these kind of things somebody mentioned beach house you know wanting to be this movie we watched today beach house had moments you know it, but yeah it, it, beach house i liked it like yeah it kept me going i wanted more at the end when they were yeah. just running around and it was just pink light i was like i just wanted a little bit more um but a couple other deep cut aquatic horror wrecks um we mentioned night tide which elric and i are both like massive fans of um so if you have not seen night tide it's one of dennis hopper's first films 1961 Might be um, i'm not sure yeah yeah it may actually be his Early first sure. now that i'm thinking about it um just beautiful arty film um a couple people have tried to remake it throughout the years um who's the guy who currently owns it Our well, yeah uh, nicholas winding riffin is the yeah. biggest fan he actually restored it and because it again fell into kind of um public domain i think and then he restored it and did a lot of stuff on his site where where they store a lot of movies for people to watch um just in nicholas went it's nwr is the website yeah um, and i think he optioned the rights with the intention has, yeah. of remaking it and i don't know if it'll happen or not um but it's just a beautiful kind of mermaid siren tale um really twisted seaside town same setting and then i'll also say and this one is not like aquatic horrors and monsters but below 
does not get nearly enough love. And this is kind of a haunted submarine in World War II. Um, I can't remember the exact political stance of it, but yeah, it's it's really good. So Hello. that was um, yeah. somebody very famous. That was one of their first movies. And I had um, Jude Law and a few people. Crap. I want to see it. You were talking about it recently. Oh, no, no, not Black Sea. Black Sea is oh, amazing. Oh, that's the Jude Law one. Um, this is, below yeah. is Darren Aronofsky. Ba- Aronofsky produced it or something. David Kep or something. Somebody, I remember when it came out. Now I know which one you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. The um, Haunted. Uh, what was that? Bruce Greenwood. He was, uh, he was in the. Um, he played the president, the- JFK. Okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was yeah. just in uh, Mike, Mike is um, Gerald's Game. He's the husband. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. He's a great so, yeah. actor, great Canadian actor. David Tui directed it. So he David Tui, that yeah. was it. So he that did Pitch it. Black and Riddick and all those kind of things. So Okay, yeah, that was it. Um, I knew somebody that I was like, they went on to do crazy good horror. And I'll also say if you have not seen Dark Waters, um, that is yeah. just a phenomenal movie. Um, the story behind it is also super fascinating. That is put out by Severin films right now. Um, and it is just it's a Lovecraftian tale. It is straight up Lovecraftian about a girl whose um, mother dies and she discovers that her mother was donating all this money to a convent that she's never even heard of. So she go- drives to the convent, um, which is on this weird little island, um, to try to figure out why her mother was literally like giving them her life savings. And then she gets there and is like sequestered with these like creepy nuns and this god. Um, and it's super crazy and just absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. And no, I'm so huh? about the French extremity uh, combination there. I'm such a fan oh of that God, that yeah. that kind of genre. And Inside's one of my favorite flicks. So yeah, it's so it's so good. I never saw the American remake because I just didn't. I couldn't do it. I was just like, I don't need to see that. You know. Yeah, same with Martyrs. I just didn't. Oh, I it. did accidentally, and I remember that. <laughs> oh my God, it was like Disney. It was like a Disney movie. Like it even ended with happy, like a happy kid skipping the. And I was like, what am I watching? <laughs> Because Martyrs is just so fucked up, you know? If you have not seen Livid, um, that definitely falls into the French extremity. But it never got a release here. Um, That is actually a really good film to think about with this one as like a double bill. Because it does have that kind of nightmare logic quality. I think it's a grim fairy tale. Yeah, I think it's a grim fairy tale completely. And it's a home invasion film with vampires. It's Mm -hmm. it's, the reason you can't see it here is because uh, as soon as it came out, Weinstein's bought the rights to remake it and then everything got shelved, never got remade. It was going to be remade by Nicholas McCarthy, weirdly enough, the guy did. um, So, but it just never happened. So because of that, we uh, don't get to see this great movie. Yeah, and then once- We need an April film, Elric. Oh, livid. Let's get the rights. <laughs> oh, livid would be. We I could doubt we could hunt down and see if we can find it. Somebody it also works, recommended yeah. Cemetery Man, which is another one that is notoriously hard to see right now. I have it on what? VHS. Wait, Cemetery Man's hard to see? I have I have it on um, Blu-ray, bl- but yeah, it's an bl- international. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's That's not true. it's not a um, stateside amazing, release. Man. You know? I think we we just so last month we did our 70s countdown for April. We are going to do an 80s one, so we might need to pick an 80s movie for our April screening. Something really crazy. big and crazy, I think. Like yeah. after Messiah of Evil, it can't be subtle. And, uh, <laughs> Am I feeling to get some drunk Pen and Lauder? Maybe, but it might Maybe. be too. Yeah, those are pretty well seen. We yeah, they're well go with known. Something that's that's not as well seen. So, yeah, but thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. Oh, thank you so much. And just as a sign off, I, uh, I'm a sociology prof. And today I taught a course on uh, horror and the sociology of horror. And a lot of awesome. that uh, draws from some of the stuff that you folks talk about. So, oh, thanks. my gosh, that is fantastic. Where are you at? I'm in Toronto, Canada. I'm at Ryerson University right now. Oh, very oh. cool. Very cool. That is that is actually um, one of my favorite kind of books was no, uh, no, Carol was at it, um, did the philosophy of horror eons ago and it is one that i still find myself referencing and i disagree with 90 percent of what he says now um but it took my entire career to come circle and be like i don't like what you're saying old man um so yeah but it's it's one that i still find myself going back to constantly totally but thank you guys for being such a lovely resource and have a lovely night thank you sure uh, just a quick answer to Justin Retke's the very latest. It says Dark Waters. What year? There's a lot of titles with same things. It's a '93 movie, so yeah. there's other titles by Mariano Bainol. 
Oh, Mariano Bagno. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see here. Do we have other... Somebody's comparing something to Swamp Thing, which I know you watched or you read. Well, yeah, I mean, like, there's a, there's a sequence of Swamp Thing, you know, a, a good few years of it, uh, I, the Alan Moore period, where it's very cosmic and very Lovecraft. I mean, it's it's more Lovecraft and cosmic than probably any movie I've seen, and it's incredible and and it's great. The very first book of it, if the first comic, you open up and on page four, there's a panel where they're talking about Don't Look Now. <laughs> so I was like, okay, these people know what's up. So yeah, I have, I've never finished that run. I don't know why, why I kind of paused at one point, but it's really good stuff. It's not what you think it would be when somebody says Swamp Thing it might not entice you. And then you start reading going, wow, this is not like a normal comic book. Oh, let's bring over Joshua Yoakam, um, who is talking about one of the other great phantasmagoric films of the 1970s, which we could not put on our list because it was technically a franchise. Joshua, are you with us? Hold on. <laughs> Click, clicking some buttons here. <laughs> how are you hey, doing? Hey, Joshua, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I kind of heard this uh, originally, like when I heard about years ago, uh, the two comparison points I had for it, which I kind of saw through and I, I didn't hear you mention, were Phantasm and uh, Dead and Buried were the two that kind of... Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, it's like it's kind of this town full of weirdos where everybody's in on it and seaside. And yes, no one, no one ruined the dead. We did mention Dead and Buried, but no <laughs> one mentioned because that's about to get a 4K restoration in the next like couple weeks. No oh, my one, God. Blue no Underground. The twist because it's such oh, yeah. a good twist. <laughs> no, but Dead and Buried is a perfect comparison because it is that kind of like, what the fuck is going on? And Maybe even we should do now, Dead and Buried. That would be a good that one. Actually, do, be actually. a really good one. Yeah, and, we could and even, if they've got a new thing, so I bet Lustig would even join us to talk yeah, about it. I would love, um, love to do Dead and Buried. Yeah, he's awesome. just a fascinating research source to begin with. But um, with Dead and Buried, that is such nightmare logic. Where Elric says, "Don't destroy the twist." Even if you asked me to explain what's happening in that movie, I would still be. <laughs> So then these, wait a sec, no, they're, no way. No, I don't really know what they're doing, but it's really crazy cool and scary. So yeah, it's-, it's Well, that's 1981, sure so it would tick our 80s box. So it would be a good way and to- not a franchise. Yeah, so and Gary Sherman, who uh, every time we inter used to interview him back in the day, he, uh, he has this thing that I love to imitate now where he, anytime he'll tell a story in the middle of each line, he goes, ba -dum -bum, uh, ba -dum, ba -dum. and then he goes, and then she goes down the street, -dum, and then ba -dum, ba -dum. and it was like, I've never had a conversation with somebody saying ba -dum, like 30 times in the conversation. <laughs> He's kind of great. Um, I love Gary. He's so much but, fun. But the other one you're talking about is top top five or six for me, movies of all time. I, a Phantasm, I just think is one of the coolest homespun movies ever made and yeah we didn't include it in our uh 70s list even though in my brain it's always 80s even though it's not it's 70s because it's a franchise but if i had done my personal favorites it would have been so high up there it's such and, cool yeah phantasm is such a perfect dream logic film or nightmare logic yeah. um because it's another one yeah. of those where like if you were like explain to me and I, it's like an undertaker and he's an alien but they're doing bodies and then there's i don't i don't know well and there's um, a scene where the guy's making love to the woman out out on the server and then suddenly it turns into the guy it's just totally frightening you know what is that yeah there's just um it's pure nightmare logic but at the same time it is so endearing and that is one of those films that would not get made today unless you were on an indie level and had a very giving producer but he was indie too that was an indie film yeah so. bought, bought the rights to dune <laughs> that could happen too. Um, so, yeah, yeah, but I, both really good comparisons. I, 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 I love that the whole series kind of goes. I, I, the first is always going to be my favorite, but the, the whole series kind of each has a different thing in it, and then you get to five, which I, you know, I. What are you going to do with part five? But um, it has those those original moments in it from yeah that from the footage they filmed from the first one. That's just. It's a real universe. Like a he, he yeah, really. It's something people never, um, it's like people have forgotten, but like it was, man, when Pulp Fiction won the Oscar, uh, I don't know if everyone remembers this moment. So Pulp Fiction wins the Oscar for best screenplay and it's um, 
uh, Quentin got it with uh, his writing partner, whose name I just totally forgot. Roger Avery. Roger Avery. And Roger Avery, they go backstage. And Roger, first person asks Roger Avery, what's next? And he's like, I want to remake Phantasm. And that's at the Oscars. How cool is that? And he had a big budget uh, script for a big budget version of a redo, and it never happened. And I, I know J.J. Abrams wanted to do it. So it is a film that, you know, Don's just such an original. There's... Well, yeah. There was also talk for a stretch about a Phantasm TV show. Um, mm -hmm. And this is years ago when I was at Fangoria because we would get like these kind of like chatter down the pipeline of, oh my gosh, so-and-so is pitching a Phantasm TV show. And I don't think anything much ever came of it past the initial pitch. But even still, they've really tried to to bring it back in some capacity. But yeah, it's, it's a Dawn vision. Um, and my favorite is definitely part three, which is the most 90s. It's like this late 80s, 90s, just conglomeration of everything that is that time period all thrown into one movie. It's just, it's wild, but it's still a phantasm movie somehow, even though that it feels so of that time period, it still is in the phantasm verse and, and feels very much like that movie. Uh, there's a just real quickly somebody in the chat said asked if Alien had ripped off No One Will You Hear You Scream. So here, let's just think about because that's in the tagline from Messiah of Evil. Who did we see at the start of Messiah of Evil? Oh, it's Walter Hill, the producer of Alien. <laughs> How interesting. The person who was going to make Alien at one point. Oh, so maybe that's your answer. I don't know. <laughs> Fascinating that you brought well, that also, up. Also, I mean, it's like Alien in the movie didn't rip it off. The marketing team at Fox did. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It wouldn't be there. But anyway, yeah, you know, definitely. you never know. <laughs> so um, David Thanks, Gester. Thank you, Joshua. Um, David Gester wants to talk about Let's Scare Jessica to Death. And I will always talk about Let's Scare Jessica yeah, to that's Death. That's another favorite. All right, David, uh, feel free to jump in. Am David, I properly unmuted? You are <laughs> properly unmuted. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. No cocktails this evening. None? I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere over the Atlantic. No, I'm not, actually. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's a beautiful uh, backdrop, really... though. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, that's old school planes where like you had leg room and they were. Oh yeah. And, and I Photoshopped some people in the background yeah. there too. Wait, it would be really funny if I go to speaker view and every time I cut back to you, those people were closer and closer. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> oh my God. Hey, um, thanks for uh, showing this movie tonight. This is the third time I've seen it. It's the movie that I forget I've seen every <laughs> single time until, um, you know, I get like the first few minutes in and then it's like, oh, damn, now I've got to watch it again. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, but 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 you had mentioned earlier, let's scare Jessica to death. And uh, on our on our, um, our little tiny podcast a year or so ago, we did let's scare Jessica to death. And we did not rate it highly enough because of an error on our part. We love that movie. And um I just, I, I think it's, I think it would be a perfect double bill with this one. I mean, you already said that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the voiceover and the psych, it's the psychology yeah. of the lead narrator. Exactly. It's, like, it's like their slow breakdown movies. Yeah. No, both and, are, yeah. For me, it's also the feeling of the post hippie, post Vietnam, like the post hippie element is more infused in Let's Scare Jessica, where it yeah. literally is like this group of hippies that show up in this weird island town with, you know, peace and love spray painted all over their car yeah. to be yeah. organic farmers. Um, and then the town's kind of encroaching on them. Um, but, you know, with this, the, the hippie element is less there, but we're still feeling it with this kind of like swinging you know, guy who shows up with his groupies and then they're all sleeping in the same bed together in this weird artistic, and even the people in the town kind of being like, if you enjoyed his type of art, like they're already kind of ridiculing that everything that dig. was. Yeah, I love that so, dig. Well, so, actually- Throwing shade there, yeah, Mr. Like, art director man. So, there's yeah. a lot of bitchiness at the start of Asai Viva, actually. A lot of <laughs> characters are bitchy to each other. But um, no, the, and you just, I hadn't even thought about this, but another one, when I was ranting at the start of this about how we don't know what these things are, it's yeah. the same and let's scare just to do that. It's easy to call her a vampire, but she's also in broad daylight the entire movie mm -hmm. and she's more like a ghost and the people in the town, what are they? Are they ghouls? Are they victims? So it's actually, you're right. That, that's a very similar effect that it's having on the people. Again, that you can't quite place, which I like. Yeah, yeah I think I, I much more prefer that level of ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, 
It's yeah, less yeah. tied to things that we already have seen a million times and know. Exactly. We yeah. also know how to defeat it. <laughs> we know how to defeat a vampire. We have right. a lore, you know. Right. We have no idea how to deal with these others. Uh, and, yeah. you know, with with uh, Zora Lampert's performance in Let's Scare Jessica to Death, to me is just, I think it's masterful. I, I, I really, truly, she seems like she's about to come undone throughout that entire movie. It makes me so uncomfortable watching her. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> presumably that was the intention. Well, we get to know her a lot better. Like the, the leads in this movie seems to be, I see, okay, the influence of Antonioni, right? That we talked about architecturally. I see it now after, cause I didn't know this before I watched it tonight. Um, I see it even more now in the facades of the people. Th yeah. There's no character that we're really getting to know in this movie. They are all facades and they're the exteriors and that's what Antonio always did. But but let's scare Jessica to death. We really feel for that Zora Lampert's character. Yeah. You get inside her skin so effectively. Her performance is, a, is really, uh, really um, vulnerable, the whole movie. Oh, extremely. Uh, can, you, can you imagine that? Oh, no. Don't you think she was probably exhausted oh. after some of those sequences? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. I, I can't imagine what it must have been like, you know, I giving that kind think, of performance. I don't think she blinks in that movie. Um, yeah. Like, it is just so focused the entire time. Yeah, I mean, movies, I do feel, when you say, is she exhausted? Yeah, I, I feel like people used to, you know, used to give everything. You know, movie, uh, somebody, I was reading about the 70s. Who was it talking about it? Was it? Oh, because George Segal just passed and something he was talking about was how in the 70s, how fun movies were in the 70s and 60s because of the schedules weren't what they are now. Now they are just militant and they're way too long. But back then everyone did like a 10 hour day. People hung out, people had fun. And now it's this very, like that. now it's just purely military based. It's based on time and professionalism. And he's just like, it's not fun. It's just now it's just work for people. And it makes that me explains, think of those movies from back in the day, you know? That explains so much whenever I'm reading the history books and it's always like, yeah, we got drunk every night after the shoot. Yeah. I'm like, how? You yeah, get home <laughs> at 10 o'clock, you have to be back on set by 5 a.m. How? It was how a do Sam Peckinpah film. What are you gonna do? Oh my no God. God. Drinking all night, you know? <laughs> I barely have time to like eat dinner and shower and dinner is usually like cup of microwavable mac and cheese in the hotel room. Like it's, it's a miserable existence when you're actually shooting. I mean, you're euphoric on set, but then in between it's just burn. Um, so that totally makes sense now. Yeah. So, but thank you so much for joining us, David. Thank you. As always, it's a real delight. Oh, one more thing about Jessica, that whole sequence where she's checking out the chicken farmer, the chicken mm -hmm. farm. Ah, ah, it just, <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave that. <laughs> That's it. But while he was talking about Let's Scare Jessica to Death, it did remind me of another um, filmmaker from this era that definitely feels in this same kind of nightmare logic as Jean Roland. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. literally on the other side of the globe, but really kind of doing the same um, nightmare logic and seaside horror in a couple of them. Like they all have this very kind of gothic, um, European Euro trash even to that capacity feel to it but a lot of them still have that kind of like um, somebody said it in the chat like the folk horror um, being blended in when you're using these kind All of rituals, like isolated yeah. communities yeah. can I just uh, answer uh, so Kirk Krongold asked if it had ever been in black and white because he had one of those sets mm -hmm. with 100 chilling classics I definitely have seen that myself because and I think that's just because it fell into public domain and somebody probably uploaded a, a, a wrong version and then it got released on one of those shitty sets but I, it, obviously it's a movie that would look pretty pretty great in black and white but Sarah Martin FYI you just blew my mind because I've been on a bit of a Michael Curtiz binge lately and i had no idea that the exterior of the house was michael curtis the director of casablanca's house oh and seriously and and the house from mildred pierce itself so i did not know that that's coming in the chat and jack fisk art direction also you know works with lynch a lot so uh so sarah thank you for uh if, if people aren't reading the comments read that because that's fascinating well, so they the, the we're, the only, we're the only ones that can see the questions oh so oh, really? when, yeah so when it's something like that i'll just pop it into the chat yeah, because okay. it's more of a comment that she's pointing out that uh, Jack Fisk is the art director um, and they're talking about, she's asking if we knew where the imitation Ruska interiors, so the art, pop art interiors mm -hmm. are, which I have no idea what the interiors were, but obviously from their group of friends, maybe it was you know, somebody back to the house, but she's saying that the exterior is, because a lot of us shot in Malibu, um, Point Doom is a real place, but the movie's set in a place called Point Dune with an N, so it's, you know, it's a is fake, it fake Doom, a big a military town? 
Might be. I think it's just a beach nearby. Or that might be Point Hume. I think yeah, I'm you might kidding. be right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know there's there's a military town north of Malibu, which actually oh, does it's, have its uh, kind it's of Port Wainimi. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, by by Ventura. No, this is up near Malibu, north of Malibu, significantly. Or yeah, actually yeah. it might be. Okay, yeah, it might be. It's like between it's like Oxnard area. Yeah, okay. That's it. That's it. Um, I've driven through there on uh we were doing like a sidetrack from Ojai, and yeah, it definitely has like weird seaside vibes to it so this whole thing so i am from virginia and we have this um little island off the coast of virginia called chincoteague um which is very kind of islandy um where people will show up and you know do the whole surfing thing during the summer but otherwise like if you go in the middle of the winter this is what it feels like um it's just this kind of boarded up town um everything's closed down for the moment and so i really want to go back there sometime and kind of you know film because it does have this beautiful vibe to it oh yeah, yeah. So talking about isolated shout out to the greatest the scene that you know sometimes you just don't really notice a moment in a movie and watching it this time i laughed out loud where the truck pulls up next to her in the desolate thing and the guy's like want to ride and she literally looks at the people in the back looking straight up in the, and then looks at the guy and goes yeah, why not? And it was the way she delivered that line that actually I thought was just hilarious. It was like clearly a joke uh, that horror films ever made. But the, that also that location is seeing this place that desolate at night is is I don't know. Super well, she awesome. was also like cool as a cucumber when the dude's like eating the rat. Oh um, yeah, yeah. I was really impressed by like yeah her grace under fire in that moment. Whatevs, man. He's yeah. cool. He's just hungry. Whatevs. So. Um, but we, uh, there's, uh, Chloe Diaz has asked a, a good kind of, what are we doing for the rest of the weekend? What are we watching for the rest of the weekend? Oh, I wanted to ask, sorry, just to, to go into this question. Did anyone watch anything at South by? Elric, did you do South by? Uh, should I do this without a rant? Here's my rant. Wait, wait. I'll just, no, I just, I think, look, I want all festivals to succeed, but I think that Sundance was much smarter by offering individual tickets because yeah. the only people who watched those movies at South by were critics. And I really, so many, every critic I know went to that because they did the critic pass. Very few other people I saw writing about the movies that week or even on Letterboxd. It just seemed like a massive, every critic and because it was so expensive. So I didn't, I didn't do it because of the price and I didn't want to go as a critic because I don't think of myself as a critic. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I gotta I tell know. you the biggest problem with South by was that it ended on Saturday night. Oh, why, why would you have your film festival run Tuesday through Saturday night? That's when, rough. When, when you've got Sunday, like I was working all week. I bought mm -hmm. the pass, you know, as, as a part of the USC thing. And so, I, I mean, it was like I wanted to really maximize it, but I couldn't watch a bunch of movies until the weekend. And the fact that it cut off at midnight on Saturday really kind of ruined the potential for how many films I could have watched. Yeah. That was one of the really nice things. Um, Nightstream was one of the online festivals. One, yeah. Nightstream combined three festivals together. It was Brooklyn, um, Horror Fest, the Overlook Fest. Maybe and Mile there was High or something? Mile know. High. There was a third one in there, and they all combined together and did Nightstream Festival this year, which was entirely mm -hmm. online. And you could buy individual films, but Elric and I got full festival passes. And it ran for like 10 days because they had so much content. That was like euphoric for me. I was driving that's back during the summer when I was touring the country in an RV. And so I would literally be in the car driving through Kentucky watching, you know, I, I saw um, Block Island Sound um, in the camper while, there, while driving through and a bunch of other stuff. Um, the Vigil, it was just like really good films. That one was really nice. And I you guess, did uh, yeah. Tribeca. Yeah, I think Tribeca, now maybe Tribeca was part of that one. I think. No, Tribeca was not because oh, I was I doing Fantasia around the same time period, which I loved Fantasia online this year. I, I just, I just don't, I just think that places it's, I don't know. You're just not factoring in the fact that everyone's been at home for a year. If you, if you have a price to go to a festival, that's $300 or $400. I you, didn't, you have to like, I was blown away by Sundance because I could just go for 12 bucks mm -hmm. and to a movie. Yeah. And it felt yeah. so inclusive. That really impressed me. I don't care if critics are the ones who get to see a movie at a festival. Like that's, they're just one part of the population and movies are for people. So, um, but anyway, yeah, no, I, I look, I love South by it's actually my favorite of all the festivals. Same here. So I don't want to say I'm yeah. slamming them. I just wish we could get price inclusivity for everyone. You know? It's, yeah. 
I, um, I want film festivals to be for everybody. And when you are only selling a $300 festival pass, yes, it definitely not. is cutting out the person who just wants to see two or three films, which was me. So this is the first year in a long time that I have not been a part of South by. But we are um, about to be a part of, um, this will just, but we haven't, we won't Panic what Fest. It is, but we are going to be a part of Panic Fest in a couple of weeks. Um, and they have a lineup that probably has any horror film that played at South West, South by or Sundance will probably be in their lineup. They have a, they, they have always, yeah. they have the best stuff. We saw Sea Fever at South by That's or at uh, Panic Fest last year. It, it's the last time um, we were together somewhere. We were at Panic oh Fest a God. year ago and doing I a live show. I forgot about that. Are. Yeah, because when we, I remember this because we flew to Panic Fest in Kansas City and I wore a mask on the plane, which I do anyway because I'm severely allergic to peanuts. And all it takes is some person like two rows in front of me to be eating a Reese's peanut butter cup and I will start having issues. Um, so I always wear a mask on a plane. And for the first time, I was not the only one wearing the mask on the plane. There was maybe two or three other people. We were just starting to hear inklings of it at Panic Fest last year. And I remember being very conscious when we were shaking hands with people at the festival, like very kind of aware of it. Unlike me. Who's I'm like, like Elric's like hugging night. everybody. And I'm like, I'm keeping my distance yeah. from everybody this weekend. Got my sanitizer. Mm -hmm. And then like two weeks later, we were in quarantine. Yeah, but it's a good fest. And that's right. That's in Kansas yeah, City. Great. Uh, so maybe look it up. If uh, there was one at South by that I thought was uh, a lot of fun called Jacob's Wife. So uh, Travis we'll... Stevens was actually watching the film tonight. I don't know if Travis is still oh, cool. here, um, but Travis is a friend of ours and I saw him watching earlier. Let me see. He mentioned he was going to watch it. Yeah. He is we... out now, but I definitely saw him. Um, we haven't seen it yet though. The, uh, the attendees list earlier tonight. Um, and I actually just got an email from Barbara Crampton while we're here um, about Jacob's wife. So yeah, um, we haven't seen it yet, but um, I love the production team behind it and Travis and Barbara are friends. So I'm really excited to see what they did. It's, with yeah, it's fantastic. It's it's so much fun. And then it really delivers. So excellent. Yeah, I've been excited to uh, check that one out. And Barbara, I saw, I can't remember if it was an article or somebody had just tweeted it, but it was like proof that Barbara Crampton is really a vampire um, because she doesn't age and she just played that part so well. And I was like, oh, I see it. It's, it makes sense now. Um, yeah, she knows she, I think she's aging. Yeah. looking even better. So it's kind of remarkable. I know, and also she's just like doing reverse. so much for our people. She's, she's being obviously very supportive of young filmmakers and upcoming filmmakers and by putting herself in movies that otherwise might not get seen. So she's, she's kind of doing the whole. Do you follow thing. her on clubhouse? She is constantly in clubhouse rooms, talking with people, heralding films. Like I still just don't just... have time. I, while everyone else learned clubhouse, I learned TM. And so like, I'm going to come up with some new ideas idea that's going to be clubhouse for the future <laughs> look you can only call it tm if you're like inside because when i, I hear so. that i'm immediately like do you have like the jaw disorder yeah, um, I just I, TMJ. Um, no, I, I have not been able to I, like i've logged every time I'll, I'll look for about three seconds and then i'll go oh, i'm out <laughs> like i'll go in and i'll walk into some conversation nope uh, i don't get it yet so but i will i'll poke around i'll keep poking around Wait, I'm sorry. Are we talking about transcendental meditation or a social media clubhouse. Clubhouse. Been, we're talking about clubhouse we're talking about clubhouse oh. but Oh, but I spent I, his spring break learning transcendental. So yeah, meditation. I was gonna. I, I never tweeted it, but I, I kept in my brain. I made a tweet, which was uh, while everyone else was learning Clubhouse, I learned to. I learned to do TM. Two two weeks later, I can deep uh, d dive into my into my inner uh, inner reaches. And uh, when I go into Clubhouse, I'm still kind of like going, uh, "How do you enter a room? I have no idea what this is." So I'm still completely lost. But uh, TM is actually pretty simple. I'm not allowed to talk about it though because it's a cult. <laughs> David Lynch will come get me. If I know, I don't or Russell it. Brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're gonna come Russell Brand's here right now. Hold on. Russell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't tell them about me, mate. Come on. Get even. <laughs> Russell, where are you at? Let's go. Anyway, He's meditating. Sorry. <laughs> Very strange, strange room I have, actually. <laughs> so this weekend, I am going to watch Crater Mass 2. Um, because I watched Quatermass in the Pit for the podcast last week, and I have not seen any of the other Quatermass films. Um, I've still so never seen any of them. It is a super oversight, um, and one that Ryan Turk has been kind of like, and Jared Rivett have both been yelling at me for years about. Um, so I watched Quatermass in the Pit last week, and I want to get Quatermass too. So I'm going completely out of order. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my, and I am, it's not exactly horror, but I started um, Murder Among Mormons last night. And I'm really curious about episode two. Wait, what was that? Murder Among Mormons. It's one of the fantastic Netflix murder documentaries <laughs> that I feel really bad watching with the enthusiasm that I do. Um, but they, it, they, they, 
they are to me what forensics files used to be where I would Mm. put on fuzzy socks and watch five episodes in a row and binge them. Um, So murder, I did not enjoy the Night Stalker documentary. I started it last night and turned it off, but murder among Mormons has been fascinating. Well, Um, not horror, but you guys have to check out the Q documentary on HBO. Oh my God, I've heard that is so good. I'm okay. not allowed to talk about that either. <laughs> so I just, I just lay off. It's, it's fine. Say, it's fine. Um, I will um, say I, that sorry. while there's also this, and this is not hard any capacity, but there's this new show on Netflix called Tiny Creatures, um, which is all about mice and snakes and spiders, but it is shot like a horror film. So while we have been, I love that you just dropped it in chat. While we have been doing this, my kids have been screaming one room over where I'm occasionally like, oh, something happened. And then I hear run from the snake. So whatever it is, it is like eight-year-old horror gold. Um, but it's just a nature documentary, but apparently it is some scary shit. That's hilarious. <laughs> There's another title that came up in the chat and then I'll answer that question. Uh, Dennis McLaughlin. Oh, my internet apparently is unstable. It just told me. Um, yeah, you're also out of sync Allison's right birthday. now. Oh, am I? birthday oh shit the australian film yeah that has a really interesting cult i mean he hasn't got the seaside so much but the cult and um folk horror vibes of that is really good it's a it's a tough one to find a good copy of right now for some reason Mm -hmm. um but i would add that to that's a good one to add to the list so um and what am i watching this weekend um i i want to watch the new i want uh for our next episode i really want to watch this new film that was just dropped on shutter today uh that apparently violation Yeah, called Violation, and I've had a couple people really recommend good. it to me. Really, yeah, good. we're doing. We had a USC That's screening of it, right? Yesterday, yeah, yeah. And um, also, I'm going to check out one tonight after this call. That it's kind of been under the radar. It's 78 minutes, so I'm very excited. Uh, my favorite thing to read. It's called The Toll, like a toll booth or toll, and it's a brand new film, and it's meant to be pretty creepy. It's meant to be an indie that uh, is getting you know, some love, and I think that hit some services. I think you have to pay for it still, but. I am going to watch that one. Yeah, just to check it out. Um, I also did a, I did a fun, I'll give Billy Ray Bruden a plug. He has a podcast called Movies with Gravy and usually does a new movie, like a new indie film that he pairs with something else. And when it, he had me on, he, we did um, 10 films each, underrated films from 2001 to now, horror films. And the only reason I'm bringing it up, he had two on there that I hadn't seen. One um, that I'll talk about on the next episode and then one super indie one. I'd never even heard of, which is, you know, kind of rare. It was called Make Out with Violence from 2008. He started at a film festival. And so I just noted that. So I'm going to try to find that. I think it's on Amazon Prime. Um, okay, just in. because it's some deep cut that I've, you know, never even seen. I mean, that's the thing about festival programmers. Sometimes they will see these films that never get a release. I've also you know? got Come True on my list for the weekend. Well, which I is still on think Netflix. it's one of the best so far. Yeah, this year. I got to get that one. It's on Netflix right now. So lots of movies, um, but yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, Yeah, my arm's getting sore and I'm getting a headache. (laughs) Oh, Jim Laskowski, uh, who I love, Jim. um, He is telling us it is on Amazon Prime. So the one we just mentioned. He Excellent. Make Out With Violence? Yes. Okay. And somebody is saying that the um, fourth quarter mass has a strong influence on the Torchwood series. Okay. Wait, is it quarter mass or quater mass? Quater mass. Thank you. This is the problem is for years, anytime that I said it on the podcast, I would say quarter mass. And then Ryan would yell at me while we were recording. And then Jared would text me when the episode came out and said, you keep putting an R in it. And it's quater mass. It's like the people who uh, tweet us after we don't talk about one movie. When we do a list of 10, they have to understand that there's more than 10 on any subgenre. So there will be omissions. <laughs> we are not doing it to hurt you. I um, love those people. I, that's how I find recommendations. Dude, yeah. it's how I found Devil Fish. So let's let's give them some love. Okay, Devil last thing fish. I'm going to call out from the Tag-along chat. Along three, Devil Fish. Which well, they can listen to your Patreon. Me. They can go go to the Patreon if you want to join that. That's super we're crazy stuff. She talked about it there. Uh, Scott Cleland at ten oh one today. He tweeted to us here. Have you folks seen Shane Meadows Dead Man's Shoes? I have no idea. I have why he's bringing that up, but I love that movie. I've never seen that movie. It's a very so that's why grim he's it up. revenge movie. That's really awesome. I don't, unless I'm wrong, maybe it's a seaside town. I don't know why he's like bringing up, and but it's a very good film, and it has a smog soundtrack, and I love smog. Ooh. So smog does all the music for it. It's a very good um, 
the guy, um, the actor from the, the, he's a British actor, but he's in the outsider, the, that Stephen King series. He's, mm-hmm. he's the one who it turns into by the end. He's a great actor. He, like he's in the opening scene of that show. And you're like, oh, I wonder when he's going to become the bad guy, but he's the guy out for revenge for his brother. And it's, it's, if you're looking for a good revenge film, probably my favorite subgenre of anything is revenge films. I love revenge films. Nice. One day we have to do a whole thing on revenge. We do. We really do. But so. now we just have to hope we don't get a weird fever in the night. Guys, we- I'm already feeling a little under. And that by no means would I not get the vaccination because I am seriously so fucking stoked. Even my kids, as soon because they were in the car today. And as soon as I got the shot, my kids leaned forward and they're like, mommy's going to take us to Legoland now. Because <laughs> I kept telling them, I was like, pick one thing that's going to get you through the pandemic. And so my five-year-old, it was the thought of Legoland, which is now built up as this like Mecca of Legos on a cloud where all of your dreams come true. It's kind of true. Um, it's pretty I'm, close to that. I'm excited to see it. But Show them I'll a Qu- Quater Mass film instead. <laughs> what, They've what, been watching. Yeah, what, tiny what's creatures going on with, uh, with the uh, new Bev? Yeah, what is going on with the new Bev? I don't have any hard answers. Uh, all I, all, only part of it, like, and I truly don't. I, I mean, I hear rumblings, but um, I do know my feeling is because it's an older theater compared to say like newer ones that are retrofitting their um, air. My guess is that one will be a little later than mm. some of the other. So if LA is opening, let's say now, right? Like so far, it's really only Burbank and a few, there isn't like even in Santa Clara. No, the the theater. I, was... I went to Century City. Oh, really? Yeah, I was out in Upland a couple of days ago and their theater was open too. The AMCs were open. Interesting. There. None of them are out, open out here for some reason. Um, but anyway, like my guess is it my guess would be my guess is June, but you know, we'll see. Oh, wow. They no Hold one on. no one no one has said anything. So um yeah, I miss it. That's what I miss most. We'll I miss back. that and the Egyptian. They're the two theaters yeah. I want to go see in all. I that that's the most interesting thing about this is I don't miss the new movies that much. Because watching them this way, I'm okay with that. It's older. Think about like our screening of Underwater and how fucking resilient that that was. It was just so fun to be in the crowd screaming with it. Like there's a couple movies that we have seen together where we've been like, even Midsommar, which I remember I was super lukewarm to on the time. And over the years, I've kind of warmed up to it a bit. But I still remember having the moments where we were like, you know, screaming. Well, I miss it all. I miss theaters. Yeah. I'm just saying like right now, no, what I what I think the difference is I got a bigger TV during the pandemic and I got better sound. And so you get to a point where you're like, well, you, you, you know, you kind of go with what you're stuck with. And if mm-hmm. I had to watch Kong versus Godzilla next week at, on my TV, I don't really care. Like it doesn't matter to me anymore. Yeah. Whereas I want to go see Nightmare Alley in a movie theater. Oh. So, and there maybe- was something really nice. Like my kids, um, we watched Raya and the Last Dragon last week and they are a pain in the ass at the movie theater. I want them to have that experience, but I want it to be the matinee at New Bev where nobody cares if they scream and then Strummer throws his popcorn, um, which they, they've done many times when we went to the Miyazaki, um, they spilled their popcorn. But like, it was always such a thing like going with them to the theater and it was so expensive. So with them, it was beautiful to watch this brand new Disney film on our couch in PJs where when he dumps his goldfish over, I'm like, yeah, cool, let's go with it. The dog will eat him. I mean, I saw uh, Skull Island in 70 millimeter at the Arclight and it Ooh. was like almost a religious experience. Oh my God. Well, I, I, well I'm going to actually, that's it. We'll bring it up as a spoiler. I hadn't seen any of those new the new ones, Godzilla or mm-hmm. Kong. So I did it all this week. So I'm going to talk about it on the next um, episode, even though we'll be recording it the day Kong comes out, unfortunately, so I won't have seen it. But um, I just thought Kong blew those Godzilla films out of the water. I don't even think it was Kong. Because Godzilla doesn't have personality in these movies. And Kong is just this character. It's really impressive. I've got to say it's going. And they they shot that film like they were making Apocalypse Now. Yeah. 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 It's a period piece was great. It was just amazing. No, it's mm. super fun. But so I am actually excited about Kong's like the new one. Mm. I genuinely want to see it because I'm also Adam Wingard, you know, is, he's one of us. He's come from this world. And he came he, from indie horror. Yeah. Tiny, yeah. tiny micro budget features to that. It's super interesting. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, like anyway, if we go any longer, the 83 people left will hear only about our kids and weird <laughs> dinner choices because that's what Patreon ends that's up being. That's what our Patreon is. Like by, by that end. time, we've covered all the big movies and the end of our Patreon is always like, so I'm thinking of trying this new meal from Trader Joe's tomorrow night, and then it's just completely off the rails. So that's where this is going to end up is um, these cool new burritos I got from Trader Joe's that I'm going to go eat after the show. Yeah, we're there now. We just because <laughs> you just did. It. Just <laughs> and somebody's did. thanking you, Alex, and they should be thanking you because we always. Yes, always Alex, do. thank you so much for letting us do these. And oh my and- god, it's it's the highlight of the month. 
Yeah, talk about really weird little movies and yeah. Well, wh- and whether we them. can do it or not, let's 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 look. You're getting a public behind the scenes. I think we're all in. If we can get dead and buried, we'll do it. If we can't, we'll find something else and we'll get Bill Lustig on because I just wrote it on the list. I'm gonna email Bill and Greg from Blue Underground tomorrow and see if they might be game. We won't be able to show them 4K, obviously, but we could show the Blu-ray and then they could and they could be um, advertising the 4K for totally fine. Yeah. yeah. And Very Bill, cool. Bill is just such, he's one of those people that like, I just want to sit with him fireside and just be like, tell me stories. Oh, I'll um, tell you stories. Let's tell yeah. you stories. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> many. I'm like, just tell me everything you can about Grindhouse scene of New York City. Um, yeah. And I just, I love talking to him. So, and it's yeah. almost like people have forgotten he's this like really awesome director. It's like people just think of him as like a guy who runs a label. Like he's such like, a good curator now. Dude, man- yeah. Maniac Cop 2. You want to see a movie that's directed like a motherfucker? <laughs> Maniac Cop 2 is bonkers. Like got how- a rap in it. Yeah, it's so good. You can't kill him with an Uzi, Elric. He'll show up in your jacuzzi. And let's remember that. That's another one Nicholas Wending Refn's meant to be remaking. But, uh, Are you serious? Yes, for Amazon. It's like <laughs> he's- From Nighttime to Maniac Cop. <laughs> I know. I don't know why it hasn't come out yet, but yeah. That's wonderful. That's the thing. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening, whoever's left. I'm going to go take some Tylenol and uh, eat better. some Trader Joe's burritos. So yeah, it's a fun <laughs> night. Good night. Thank everyone. you guys. Have an awesome night.